there is an idiom saying that the third time is the charms. So why don't we raise the hope that this will work in Starship's case, meaning that its Flight 3 will have a different outcome compared to the previous two? Yeah, this is entirely possible with SpaceX's current snowball progress. Let's see what SpaceX and Elon Musk are doing to guarantee the next Starship flight will become a huge success. Discuss everything about this in today's episode of TechMap. But before we begin, our team extends a warm welcome. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and enable notifications to stay up to date with the latest news from SpaceX and the world of space. With that in mind, let's jump straight into today's episode. Over 20 years of development, SpaceX has always chased its testing philosophy as test, fly, fail, fix, repeat, and its effectiveness is off the table. As on the flow of evolution, we have been witnessing the Starship rocket growing up gradually over each of its flight tests. On Flight 1, Elon Musk only set the goal of not exploding the launch pad, but on Flight 2, the rocket went much further as Booster 9 helped Ship 25 to reach outer space. So, on the next flight, what will you expect? Well, I'm so glad to see your answer in the comments section below. And now let's discuss how SpaceX and Elon Musk will ensure the next Starship flight will have a different outcome than the previous ones. Postscript, I also hope to find my own answer after this video. The first thing we must discuss is the stable operation of the 33 engines combined with the flow of fuel within the Super Heavy. The issue here likely revolves around delivering fuel to the booster engines after they separate, because it has to ignite a subset of engines to control the atmospheric re-entry. In the second flight test, almost all the fuel was exhausted. This rocket is, you know, 60, 70 miles up in the sky, it's swinging back and forth and there's not much propellant left in the tanks. And so it turns out to be really a challenge to get the oxidizer and the methane propellant all the way to the bottom into the engine. Therefore, the natural propensity of fuel is actually to rise to the top of the vehicle. This requires some technical solutions to precisely regulate the fuel flow. So far, we have not yet heard how this will be managed, so the space community suggested their own methods. First, staged and separated tanks in the cylinder to power fuel after the bulk is used up. A piston system in the cylinder could be utilized to push the fuel into the engines, and large bladder structures will be used to push against the fuel, no matter how the cylinder is rotated. Because surfactants that do not allow bubbles to be formed will clog the intake tubing in the engines. Therefore, we need completely separate tanks for fuel supply after separation and automatic switching to those tanks, with a priming mechanism that does not allow gas bubbles to form. Last, but not least, unless a system is developed to provide and maintain fuel to the engines at all rotations of the cylinder, the engines will stumble and not reignite. One small note, gravity is not enough to solve this issue. The second one is about hot staging. This Russian technique clearly performed excellently in the recent test, but there are also opinions that this technique still needs to be improved in upcoming flights. Engineers designed the hot stage ring or HSR for short to protect the top of the booster from the heat of the second stage ignition. However, the metal of the HSR though made of stainless steel, the same as the rocket fuselage, with the same thermal tolerances, the HSR was unable to tolerate the combined force and thermal intensity of the three sea levels Raptors and three vacuum Raptor. The HSR became superheated, transferring the thermal variant to the liquid methane fuel tank, causing the tank's detonation. A possible resolution to this problem is to add thermal protection to the dome of the HSR or the top of the methane fuel tank. This is because the methane gas, being pumped back into the tank for pressurization, is vulnerable to the increase in temperature of the hot staging. As for the Starship's second stage, more thermal protection may need to be added to the undercarriage. There is a possible seal failure of one of the Starship engines caused by the intense heat of hot staging. If the hot staging was the highlight in Flight 2, I'm pretty sure that in Flight 3, the spotlight would belong to refueling tech. As a part of gearing up for NASA's Artemis 3 scheduled in December 2025, SpaceX and NASA could take a tentative step toward orbital refueling on the next test flight of Starship. These cryogenic fluids include liquid hydrogen, methane, and liquid oxygen, which must be kept at temperatures of several hundred degrees below zero, or they turn into a gas and boil off. NASA and industry engineers want to extend this lifetime to days, weeks, or months, 
but this requires new technologies to maintain the propellants at cryogenic temperature, and in some cases like Starship, to transfer the propellants from one vehicle to another. SpaceX is collaborating with NASA's Glenn Research Center and Marshall Space Flight Center on the demonstration. To achieve orbital refueling of Starship, it should be well within the capabilities of SpaceX. The company has explained that the two Starships that are to transfer fuel will dock base to base. The docking should be no more difficult than Crew Dragon capsules docking with the ISS. Then pipes have to be connected, if not already achieved during the docking. In the worst case, nozzles with flexible hoses have to be pushed into fluid couplings. SpaceX has lots of experience with liquid oxygen couplings, and now also has experience, especially in Boca Chica with liquid methane couplings. The SN4 explosion was due to a problem with a quick disconnect coupling on the test stand, but SN5 was filled and tested fine and disconnected itself for a launch. Then using small thrusters on one or both starships, they are accelerated in the direction of the tanker so the fuel settles on the bottom of its tanks. The acceleration will help pull the fuel down into the consumer starship, but the transfer could be driven by controlling the pressure in the tanks in the two ships. The fuel transfer might only take a few hours. Then, close valves, disconnect couplings, unlatch ships, use small thrusters to move apart to a safe distance before using main engines, and any liquids in short open pipes should just boil off. The next up is the heat shields of Starship, which will be reinforced onto the spacecraft using a different method. Basically, Starship's thermal protection system is reliable and equipped fully even though we saw the falling out of several heat tiles during the ascent in the November test. However, it's not a big deal. The matter in Flight 2 was due to SpaceX missing out on testing each brick with a suction cup to verify their adhesion. To solve this issue, they still use a system of three clips for each tile, but instead of being spaced as far apart as previously, those three clips move closer together. This hinted at the reduction of the brick size, which would significantly improve the heat shield tiles' strength, making them harder to crack. Perhaps SpaceX will apply this new design for the whole system on the vehicle, or they will use a hybrid approach, given that just installing the smaller size tiles in more challenging areas like near the flaps, while the majority of the ship's area is unchanged. Besides that, the new heat tiles might be getting a metal insert for an unknown reason. On the other hand, some guessed that those were not stainless steel inserts for the new smaller tiles, but there were steel mock-ups of the new tiles. And that just about wraps it up for today's episode. Make sure you subscribe to the channel and turn on the notification feature so you don't miss any space important updates. Your support is our driving force to continue delivering high quality content. Thank you and we look forward to seeing you next time.